wasn't whether you were man or woman or rich or poor or whatever. It was what you had to say and the way you treated people. And as far as the music, what you were capable of. And that's what people looked at for the most part. I mean, there's always few. There's a, a chauvinist in every crowd. There's got to be, you know, but uh, it doesn't bother me. And there was lots of girls that were into, you know, playing or singing or, you know, doing, doing their punk rock thing. Well, there was the Zealots in town, which were an almost all-girl band. And uh, they influenced me a lot in that, you know, well, it doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman, it's what you're capable of. And that's down to you, you know, so. And then there was a crash 80s with Linda Harvey on bass, and she was a great inspiration to me. I'd only been playing bass for two months the first time that I saw them, and, and it was just, you know, if I can play like her, you know, I can do whatever, you know. And there was UK with my buddy Rose in it, and uh, she was excellent. Her voice, the, you know, it, it amazes me to this day the, the range that she had developed in her voice and how she could go, you know, from really a low tone to an extremely high tone. There's lots of girls that were into, you know, playing or singing or, you know, doing doing their punk rock thing. I think one of the best local recordings would be the, the Hippies, the Nuclear Disaster uh, EP. That's it, Kelly Mulvey on vocals. Brian Young, Lindsay Young. And Henry Cox. I don't think gender really mattered. To me, it didn't matter. To me, it, like, it didn't make one difference to me whether, like, I really love Marianne Faithful, and I like her raw and her gritty voice. Um, now, when I see girls up there on stage doing their thing, I really like that. I, I tend to have sort of a, a preference for girls who can get up there and do that. Um, as far as it is different again, you know? It is sort of different to see girls up there doing it. It's really common nowadays. It's no surprise that punks question conformity and authority by looking and sounding different. Economic and social disparities unleveled the playing field. British punks were tired of being on the dole, out of school and out of work. They felt alienated from the rest of society. Some of those elements were true in the forest city. And for the most part, the movement was still an outgroup, isolated from the mainstream. I think our punk scene was a part and parcel of the stuffiness of the city that uh, a lot of people felt they were being suffocated and, and we needed some air, so we made some room. I think a lot of people were feeling like rejects basically and so they all kind of huddled together and, and got comfort from each other is what I, near as I could tell from some of it. Some of the people were like that, other ones were, I don't know, a little more punk rock, rock snobbish in some ways, you know, because they were the first punk rockers and they, I don't know if they really wanted other people joining in or not, but they had to get some new blood in there because there were only about 20 of them. What were they going to do? I think it was just a gathering of uh, oddballs, and it still is. If you like, if you look at uh, the young punks or whatever, they remind me of like the kids that were probably in the Star Trek club <laughs> back in high school or something. You know? Like they just seem like oddballs. They're you know the weirdos of society. And I think when I was in high school, I was trying to sort of like. You know, like most people in high school, you try to stay somewhere in the center and, you know, and you're ignored, kind of. Because everybody was just totally out there. They weren't inhibited at all, you know, and they were allowed to be the, the weirdos that they are, and people have, uh, not only tolerated it, but they appreciated it and they pushed it forward. They say, yeah, you know, be the weirdo that you are. Yeah, come on, do that. Yeah, you know, go ahead. Yeah, you know, whereas everything else in like high school, it's like suppressing it. If somebody is the least bit weird, you know, somebody's going to point that out right away. You're weird. Well, for, for me, it was great because it was the first time I ever felt like I fit in anywhere, you know. That, that was the big thing.
you feel like you're a misfit, well, you're not going to sit in the midst of everybody wearing their designer clothes and everything. So you go someplace where everybody else looks like just as much of an old ball as you. So you fit right in. 99% of the city was terrified of it. I mean, they didn't know what to make of it. And that was part of the exciting element of it, too. I mean, we had people, mothers, who would turn their children's head away so that they didn't look at us because we were odd or different. People were pretty weird. I knew one guy who used to eat glass, like bite glass. Like when he'd be drinking out of his glass, he'd finish it and he'd chew the glass. Like what's with that? I don't know. And cut themselves up, I don't know. But. Some people went down Dundas Street and smashed windows on both sides of Dundas Street. And the next day there was a write-up in the free press. Uh, it said, uh, punk rock band, um, invades London. Okay, let's go spray bomb some buildings, gang, okay. That was fun in those days. I think he dropped his drawers once or twice, which I find absolutely disgraceful. He used to bang glasses off his head. One day, it was working, people get all excited about it. One day he did it, the whole room went silent. That was the last time he did it. <laughs> and Pogo went so wild, he knocked me right over. He was on the tables and throwing everything around, and he jumped off, knocked me totally over. Laying on the on the floor in uh, in my living room, reading the Toronto Star. The headline was uh, "Rock is alive and sick and living in London." Mainstream media tried to defang the beast, so the punks countered with fanzines. It allowed them to express their views, but it also brought greater attention. As the musicianship improved, the performances became more astute, and the fashion, although still outrageous in camp, became more contrived. Lo and behold, we ended up opening for a, a band at the Cedar Lounge, the Blue Boot. And I was just on top of the world. I thought it was the greatest thing. I had a couple of glasses of wine before I went on. Threw on a little eyeliner. The rest was history. This got me such an attention getter. Marky was the glam guy, always yeah. into glam, the makeup and the whole bit. Scott was into that too. Well, all of them were, like the doll's influence, for sure. Came out on stage with a monk's cowl on, and all you could see were these earrings swinging back and forth, big silver earrings catching the light, swinging back and forth. And it was not until probably 10 or 12 songs that he took the cowl off, and then you saw all the the jewelry and the makeup and the, it was great. Played at the legendary CBGB's once with uh, uh, Johnny Blitz's band from the Dead Boys and then the, all the Dead Boys were there except uh, Stiv. It was uh, August, it was about 3,000 degrees out and we were going into New York and you know, the traffic is like, you can walk faster in traffic. And we had the van open, the back door open to the van, you know, and feet are hanging out while we're going into New York. To be up on stage there, wow. Thought we made it for a day. So one of these conventions was in Boston, it was around 1984. I am there early and I see this tiny car drive up with Ontario license plates, and four guys climb out of the car, and it looks like the kind where you see four clowns climbing out of a little miniature car at the circus. And I asked who they were, and they said they were four guys from London, Ontario, and they called themselves 63 Monroe. And being the music director of a radio station, I asked if they had any records that they had brought with them that they'd like a radio station like ours to play. And they pulled out this 45 here of Henry VIII. And they said, here, can you get this some airplay? And I said, I'll do my best. And what ended up happening was we played it on our station and it just had a life of its own. A few months later, we received a second record from 63 Monroe. It was the recording of White Christmas, this little revved up version that they did, which was very popular here in London. So I was about ready to start playing it until I looked at the back of the record and among all the credits, was my name right here, Chuck Miller, and my radio station, WHCL. So that was a very nice touch. Your 